Welcome to Killer Psychologist. I'm Dana Anderson, a forensic psychologist and your host of the show. Killer Psychologist is for true crime fanatics and anyone intrigued with the dark side of psychology. Welcome. My name is Dana Anderson, and I have two of my favorite people here with me today. I'm a forensic psychologist, and we have Craig Wetter here today, who's a forensic psychologist, also a retired police officer, also an attorney. So Craig and I met about 10 years ago when we were in school. We had some traumatic bonding at one of the sites where we worked. And then this summer, we, we met Jason Jensen, private investigator, so Fox Nation flew all of us to San Diego to film an episode with Mark Herman about the Brian Kohlberger murder trial. So we met Jason Jensen, who's now our friend, and he's here today. He's everywhere helping solve cases nationally. Some of the biggest cases, uh, O.J. Simpson, you know, Tupac. We have John Bonet Ramsey, which we're going to talk about today, that is a case that happened in 1996. But while I was in school, I remember studying that case and it was unsolved. So a six-year-old that was found sexually assaulted in her parents' basement on Christmas Day. And in school, I'm sure, Craig, you studied it too, but we were supposed to solve the case as part of our school assignment, which obviously no one did. That's why we have Jason here today who's co-founder of Cold Coalition, so he helps solve cases. And a lot of these crimes are catching up with people now because of DNA evidence, which I'm going to have Jason go talk about that. Jason, tell us where we're at in this case and tell us how you actually got involved, who hired you and how you got into this case. Hi, Dana. Hi, Craig. Yeah, I'm glad you could have me on today. Um it's really quite interesting. Um, last year, it was August 2022, the Cold Case Coalition went national. Prior to that, it was Utah Cold Case Coalition and it was founded in 2017. So when we decided to go national, I thought, well, you know, what case out there would make the biggest impact, uh, you know, marketing wise for the Cold Case Coalition as making a statement? You know, do you? look at a bunch of little ones across the country, or do you grab one big one that everybody is aware of? And my partners went looking for other smaller cases here and there and everywhere, and I decided, well, why don't we take the most daunting, impossible case in America to look at to see what, if anything, could be done in my selection was John Benet Ramsey. I mean, it's been 26, almost 27 years. It's called well, you know, Boulder would say differently because there's a lot of recent activity, but, you know, in the sense of a cold case, no real lead, no solution, it fits that model. So I reached out to, to John Ramsey last year and I asked him, you know, usually I ask a single question. There's usually one question that really makes a difference in my mind, whether it's something I can help out or not. And believe it or not, I looked at John Bonet Ramsey's case as, well, this is something I can't really contribute to. The biggest minds, the best experience, the most knowledgeable experts out there have looked at this case. What little thing could I actually do that hasn't already been done? Well, despite the obvious hurdle to overcome, I reached out to John Ramsey and asked him a single question. I go, in light of my experience as a cold case investigator, and, you know, DNA has, uh, with uh, genetic genealogy, has shown us that most of these cold cases that were cold, it came back to a neighbor. A neighbor was the one that committed the crime. Some of the cases that come to mind were Angie Dodge, and I listed a short list to him, examples where it was a neighbor who was unknown that you know, ultimately was tied to being responsible for the crime. In response to my question about neighbors, you know, I said, you know, is there were their neighbors checked out by law enforcement? And he said they didn't even bother to do a neighborhood check. So to me, that was 
a surprise. It's like, oh, wow, at least I have something I can look at. I can look up records of the neighbors, you know, run addresses and see if there was anybody in the neighborhood that has had criminal activity since that would stand out as a likely criminal element because, you know, you guys know as psychologists, you know, once a serial killer, always a serial killer, right? You know, I, I can't imagine you wake up one day, you know, 47, decide you're going to go on a killing spree. There's usually criminal behavior leading up to that moment in time that, you know, is the, the crime in question. And then there's subsequent behaviors that kind of stand out too. You know, you just don't, what, it's rare that you're a one-off, right? You're just going to commit a heinous murder with a sexual component and you're just going to go back into the to the, the word work and you know no one's going to notice you you're not going to behave differently on that anniversary or anything so that's what started it and uh you know a lot has taken place since then uh but you know here we are a year later and i feel we have a strong suspect that we're pursuing that I, I believe, you know, with all my fibers responsible for her death. Wow. I can't believe 26 years later, they still have never explored other leads like the neighbors because they zeroed in on the mom so hard. Um, I mean, they even had a handwriting expert that went over the ransom note and they wanted to tie her to it and there was I mean they really threw her under the bus but it, it ruined the 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 entire family's lives and I know I don't know if you know the son Burke they did a episode on television it was CBS in 2016 where they were alluding that he was guilty of this crime against his sister and he ended up suing them for $750 million. I don't know what the final number was, but I just, can you imagine that's your your sister or your <laughs> daughter and television, they were, you know, sensationalizing this, but they wanted to hold someone accountable. And even when I studied this case year, years ago, you couldn't help but think ill of the mother or father, just thinking somehow they were involved. You just had nothing else to go by. It didn't make sense, the ransom note. Now, what do you want to say about the ransom note, Jason? Well, you know, it's really quite interesting about the ransom note. Uh, you know, I had a piece come out in the U.S. Sun way over a year ago uh, where there was a likely source of the signature where it was, we're all familiar with the saying, Victory, SBTC. And it's, there's been wide speculation what that meant, whether it was made up or if it was identifying of a possible suspect. You know, there's even been rumor about it being tied to Subic-based training center and whatnot, things like that. But what was really interesting that was brought to my attention was 10 months before the abduction, if you will, or the crime, there was a, a journal a uh, research paper that was done by two University of Colorado professors there, you know, a half a mile from the Ram from the Ramsey's home. And the acronym for their research was SBTC, which was a single band truncated crystals, which was a new novel way of uh, developing semiconductors. So here we go. There's an SBTC just 10 months before, half a mile away. You know, is it a coincidence or could this have been a student of theirs that those initials were fresh on their mind when they were writing the ransom note? So that was one of the things I revealed to the world and it, you know, was picked up by the U.S. Sun. But it was interesting from that because of that piece uh, earlier this year, a Japanese documentary company wanted to do a John Bonet Ramsey documentary about the case. And out of all the people in the world, they randomly selected me to be on the show. I'm guessing from the recent coverage from SBTC. And uh, one of the things that they wanted me to do 
was go interview a, a man by the name of Michael Vale, who had a classmate that at one point hit the spotlight. His name's Gary Oliva, who early on was rumored to confess to the crime. Uh, Michael called Boulder uh, PD. And then in 2002, Boulder PD, in response to an episode of 48 Hours Investigates, claim that Gary Oliva was eliminated as a suspect because his DNA did not match the crime scene. So, you know, fast forward to 2022, 2023, we're thinking, okay, there's no connection. The world's already been informed by Boulder that, you know, DNA didn't match him. So what's interesting is I go into this documentary thinking, okay, I'm just being like a host or whatnot fulfilling their request to go interview different aspects of the case. And I can even present my own theory, which I did. But as we're in uh, Ventura, California, and I'm interviewing Michael Vail with camera and producers and directors, he tells a very compelling story, Michael does. I'm sitting there with an open mind. I'm going, holy bejesus. This guy confessed, and under the context, and I already, you know, did some research and everything. The guy's stories matching repeated, you know, examples of where he's talked about this. There's no evolution. There's no embellishing. Same story over and over and over. And we in the in the forensic interview world, we often give a credence to an interview if that if being truthful if it does not evolve. So. I listened to this guy, and I'm like thinking in my mind, though, DNA excluded it. It's like, well, I understand you think he did it, but DNA excluded it. Then he starts breaking out handwritings, letters, confession letters, and things like that. And I'm reading them. I got on one side of me is the ransom note, uh, and I got these letters, and I'm familiar with the ransom note. I've studied it left and right. I've uh, identified. The, the level of vocabulary in the words, you know, like uh, th three of the misspelled words were eighth grade uh, vocabulary words, and then there's 11th grade vocabulary words that are spelled correctly, and I'm sitting there, you know, I hyper-studied the ransom note, and I'm sitting there looking at these letters, and I'm saying, oh, the letter A matches. Oh, look at that, the letter L. Oh, look at the numbers. Okay, so I'm sitting there going, Michael, can I take copies of these? Because, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, ooh, there's something here. And we know that Boulder PD claimed that he was you know, excluded by DNA. We don't know if that was a genuine exclusion or maybe the DNA that was tested was a handler and not necessarily, just because they claim that it's unknown doesn't necessarily mean it's suspect DNA. It, you know, it's unknown. We don't know the origin. So I'm starting to question how sincere the elimination is by DNA. I'm sitting there saying, but no one has claimed that the handwriting excluded him. And I'm sitting there saying there's enough here that it's worth it to me as an investigator to invest. You know, and I, I end up hiring two handwriting experts that go over it. And sure enough, they come back with a high degree of certainty, uh, probability is how they claim, uh, on a 1 to 5 scale, they give it a 1.5, whereas formerly, when Patsy was supposedly uh, identified as being responsible for the handwriting, they gave her a 4.5 on one expert. Three experts gave her a five, which is a complete elimination. So because one expert came back with a 4.5, and the explanation was, I'm pretty sure she did it, but I can't be positive. Because one out of four says, I'm not sure. They ran with it and blamed her as being the author of the ransom note. That sounds like, for lack of better words, malpractice. It's like, how can you, in clear conscience, say that, in, on an investigative standard that she's responsible with such a high degree of unlikelihood. Anyway, so 
here we are, you know, all these years, the family's been maligned, Patsy's been accused, you know, adding insult to injury. It's bad enough that you would lose your daughter in a terrible crime under your nose in your own home, but then to be shrouded with with uh, doubt in your word and, you know, mired with uh, responsibility for a for the crime, it's like, how do you overcome that? It's like, not not only did you kick me while I'm down, but you smothered me too. So, wow. Anyway, so we feel pretty confident that, uh, you know, and I've even contacted Boulder PD and they just ghost my emails. So they're not interested or they're doing something just not letting me you know. Guess we'll find out. I would imagine through the years they've been bombarded. This case has been in the media so long. You know, I think as a, they did interviews across 19 states, there was over 21,000 tips, you know, thousands of interviews. I want to go back to what you were saying about the DNA was excluded. And I'm thinking originally this case in 96, either they didn't have a DNA match or what are they saying? Because... At the time, in 96, they ran labs. They had no match for anyone. But now, is there a match in DNA, Jason? Where we're standing right now, I'd say no. And and I know enough about the DNA. You know, my Cold, Cold Case Coalition actually developed the only nonprofit DNA lab in the country, Intermountain Forensics. So I have ex- access to opinion. You know, I don't have access to, you know, uh, cases that are reviewed, there's definitely a barrier between me and them in that regard, but I at least can talk to the lab manager and things like that and even submit my own samples, which I did. I took uh, an envelope that was clearly from Gary Oliva in, in the 1970s and had the lab do an extraction from the edge of the envelope and from the stamp to see if they could get a profile. And Unfortunately, it was a mixture, so it means there, there was a major and a minor male profile, but with a mixture, you really can't run that through CODIS or whatever because you don't know which alleles attribute to whom. We don't have the technology yet to unmix profiles that way. Now, what you can do is if you have an actual known sample or reference to compare with, you can see if they have overlapping matches, but you can't tell to the exclusion of others in that capacity. So uh, what we end up finding out is that the unknown male DNA, is co- they call it in the, the case UM1, okay? And where that those samples were taken from was during the time frame when the case was in front of the grand jury, Mitch Morrissey, the deputy district attorney from Denver, uh, was there to assist. And he was in charge of the DNA because he had that kind of experience. When they ran the DNA at the time, uh, they ended up uh, finding out there was two samples along the, the, the waistband of the Long Johns. And then there was on a blood stain, which was identified to be John Bonet's, there was a minor Mel's DNA matching the two from the waistband. So... They suspected that that was suspect DNA, but mind you that uh, DNA was in its infancy at that time, and at that time, what was really mostly relied upon was blood, semen, and saliva DNA, body fluids, and touch DNA didn't really come around until like around 2010, 2005, 2010, you know, uh, DNA experts would know better than I do, but I know it was not following the same path as as your body fluid. To go in hindsight on a case that's cold, that's old, and do touch DNA is a little bit risky uh, con- compared to like a fresh case that happens today where they can do rapid DNA right there at the crime scene even, and there's no margin of error. One of the things that I always worry about when they do touch DNA after the fact is how do we know that between the time that it was first tested to the time of the retest, somebody thought, well, we're done testing, and they discard the uh, 
level of forensic protection and protocol that they would have in place once they felt it was, you know, already exhausted what they could do. After they test it, do they bundle it up into their stuff into a paper bag barehanded? Uh, when they put their, when they re glove, you're going to have your hand is exposed when you put this glove on. Now you got this glove and put this glove on. Do I have my DNA on this glove because I used the bare hand when I first put it on? And you almost have to like double up to prevent that. Or if I reach into the bag and I got skin cells, epithelial cells that fall out of my sleeve, does that go into the bag with right. the evidence and cause cross contamination that way? There's a lot of things that can happen in the realm of touch DNA that can contaminate or compromise the, the, the integrity of the evidence that you really have to be mindful of. And it's hard to imagine every scenario that you're going to have protection to prevent. I, I've seen where they use the n to DNA test. It, when they extract, they don't just extract the source. They may extract the entire surface of the of the item that they're they're testing to kind of get a higher volume of a DNA sample. But when they do that, they're actually running the potential of creating a mixture because maybe on this far right corner is the suspect DNA, but on the left corner is is something innocent like a family member because they had to dress the victim or something, and now it's all mixed up rather than just concentrating a larger volume of one individual. You run the risk of just throwing the whole thing down the drain because you're sucking up everything. I had a pair of boots that I brought in for DNA testing in a homicide that was stored by a mother since 1986. It was stored in a brown paper bag, and unfortunately... They couldn't get any DNA because it was for so long. But when they collected, they impact the entire boot. It's like, how is that helpful? <laughs> if you know, it, it's something like a like a counter at a at a bank where you're going to have thousands of people touch it. You're certainly not going to impact the entire counter top of the the teller window. So, you know, at some point, you have to realize technology is it, and, and how they're utilizing it can actually make the case they're harder to solve or at some point it'll get so tiny in its efficacy that now all of a sudden you know something from like the manufacturer has such a tiny amount of dna that has nothing to do with it is going to accidentally be drawn into a case because wow we got a hit but it has nothing to do with anything because it was part of the manufacturing or the packaging or the delivery or something like that. What about, so this guy is confessing, right, Jason? Right, right. So what's the next step? Do you, do you what, this what? is the guy? We, we need some connection. We're trying to connect the DNA to write, to get a conviction. What's his motive for confessing at this point? Well, what's weird about that is, is oftentimes in high-profile cases, you get wackadoodles that come forward and, and make confessions simply because a variety of different reasons, mental health, notoriety, you know, a, a feeling of inadequacy that they need to fulfill, you know, trying to impress somebody. So many different reasons that can go into why someone would falsely confess. And it's so weird to me that so many people have been dismissive of Gary Oliva's confession. Oh, he was a homeless person. Oh, he was just this, this. He was just that. Not paying any mind to the fact that he had proximity. The victimology matches his criminal history. He's got an obsession. He was there at the first anniversary candle, candlelight vigil. All the things that individually on cases have been a reason for law enforcement to focus on this offender or that offender. But we have several of them and people are quick quickly to dismiss him as a as a viable candidate, minimizing his his role here. Oh, 
He's not a pedophile. He was just a homeless man in the neighborhood. Excuse me? That seems seems to trivialize the, the possibility, if not the probability, he committed this crime. Whereas another individual, as an example, uh, John Mark Carr, who was in Thailand sending encrypted emails to a journalist claiming responsibility that then was handed over to law enforcement and they traced it back to him and arrested him and, and then they extradite him to the U.S. to stand for responsibility of this. Then uh, they once they investigated, they realized he was confirmed to be in Atlanta at the time because it was the holidays. He was there with family in Atlanta, had nothing to do with this. It was impossible to do. And yet people will still bring him up saying that we think he did it or he could have done it or whatever. It's like, no, he confessed. He had no reason to confess. He has an alibi. But they'll want to blame him, but they'll excuse Gary Oliva. So, you know, go figure. But yeah, he's been confessing, in fact, Talking to Michael Bell, the confession came first by way of Gary calling uh, Michael the night of, completely uncontrollably weeping. I hurt that little girl. You know, called Michael on the phone out of control and hyperventilating. And, you know, a little bit of give and take back and forth between Michael and Gary, he learned that he was in Boulder which was a shock to Michael because last he heard he was up in Oregon where his last victim, he raped a seven-year-old in, in 1990 and was doing time, but had absconded, left the jurisdiction of Oregon when was hiding in Boulder. And then a few hours later, Michael gets a copy of the LA Times delivered on his front porch. He's looking at, you know, he's looking at the, the, the paper in the lower corner of the paper says six year old slain in in Boulder and he's like oh my gosh so he calls he calls nine one one for uh, Boulder PD and leaves a voicemail and you know even though that's a tip it was ignored so Jason at the beginning you you mentioned that the Boulder Police Department at the initial outset of this investigation did not do a neighborhood canvas. Is that is that accurate? Is that what you is that what I heard you say? Yes, yes. The the, the exact wording was no neighborhood check. Okay. So that's completely inconsistent with best practices, right? In terms of what you do at a, at that type of a crime scene with that magnitude of crime. I mean, my twenty eight plus years of experience, I've done hundreds, if not thousands, of neighborhood canvases, you know, when you have serious crimes and that so so what was uh Gary Oliva's um proximity in that and during that time frame did have, have have you figured that out yet yes craig he was living in the neighborhood uh couch surfing on a former high school friend of theirs and uh would actually pick up mail at a church a community church just 13 doors down from the ramsey's home that had a alleyway in common with the with the Ramses and the church that he would go there to the food bank. So, you know, it's speculated that he would see Jean Bonnet in the alley as he's walking by the house. So you've got proximity. You've also got um, history in terms of his um, proclivity to engage in the sexual assault of children. You he he served time and was he was he on parole from Oregon or was he um did he just like fail to show for his for his sentencing and then he was essentially on the run? Yeah, he was on parole and absconded. Left, left the, the state jurisdiction. What's his status now? Is he on parole? Is he a registered sex offender? He is a registered sex offender. He is serving time in Colorado uh prison system for a twenty sixteen arrest of possessing of child pornography. What, and what was intriguing about that is when they were going through his, his digital devices, they found over 300 and some odd images of child, child pornography and over 200 and some images of John Bonet. Don't let this guy out. Come on. There are some serious sex offenders um, 
I actually went to evaluate one remotely from the jail system the other day. The guy was too disorganized to have an interview or form a sentence, but I just haven't dove into his records, but I could see there's a history of rapes and registered sex offender and in and out of jail, decades of time in prison and the system. We see these people go in and out of the system and um, new crimes, a whole list of crimes, uh, hundreds of pages for me to go through. It's frustrating the system that is in place because a lot of these people that Craig and I will see, we evaluate people for competency to stand trial, their mental state now, or insanity. And some of these people, they go to the state hospital, they get treatment, or they let them out, or they can't be restored. There's a whole number of different reasons. And it's it's so frustrating to see it's the same offenders repeating the same crimes. So it, it's, it's a frustrating to even know this case has taken this long. And here we are. If we're talking pedophilia here, which is or this is a paraphilia and this is a type of a psychiatric uh, disorder, we know that pedophiles um, are not amenable to treatment generally. Just generally speaking, um, they don't get over this in most cases. And if they are allowed to, you know, go back into the community um, without adequate safeguards, supervision, or you know, uh, other modalities like chemical castration and things like that, they're probabilities of reoffending are are generally very high um, and I've interviewed many many pedophiles and generally they will they will tell you that they cannot control these impulses they are go they will reoffend I mean there's just um, that's just the fact of it and we, and we see that consistently repeated so to hear that um, this uh, Gary Oliva has a history of sexual assault of, of children it sounds like you know again pedophiles have object choice Generally, they'll have age ranges that they favor. And was this a, was this a, did you say a seven-year-old girl that he sexually assaulted in Oregon? Yes, yes. Uh, and one of the other offenses that he committed that we haven't mentioned that you guys will take uh, shock to is the fact that, bear in mind, uh, John Bonet was strangled, right, with a ligature, you know, the garage. Gary was also convicted for strangling his mother with a phone cord. Yeah. That's very specific. Yes. This age range, strangulation. Well, um, again, this is, you know, the strangulation piece is also built in, uh, and it doesn't have to necessarily <laughs> always uh, involve a sexual need or gratification piece. But but in many cases, you know, when as Dana knows that when a sex offender is engaged in a sexual assault, oftentimes they will, will engage in say, sadistic acts. Because that's the only way that they can get sexual gratification is by inflicting harm on others. And so that cross can cross over into uh, just other behavior as well. So him being convicted of, of uh, strangulation of his mother doesn't surprise me that, that that's a consistent pattern of um, sadistic um, behavior. Uh, we see it very consistently with uh, sexual offenders, especially the sexual, well, the sexual sadists, right? The ones that are, they engage in rape or other forms of sexual assault, and then they will either murder their victim uh, or they will seriously uh, injure or maim them. Well, I'm curious to see where this case is going to end up. You know, if Boulder Police Department is going to move forward or they feel like they have exhausted their resources. I mean, are we, where are they at? I mean, I guess we're going to stay tuned. Yeah, Jason, have they told you that they're, um, they're, are they just not giving you, are they radio silence with you or are they, are they just telling you, hey, this is still an open case? I mean, I understand it's a cold case, but these cases... They generally, Boulder's probably a big enough agency that they probably have a cold case homicide detective that they works these cases or they have them, you know, kind of in the background. And, and when leads come in, they will, will investigate them. I don't, does Boulder have a cold case unit or a, a cold case homicide detective? Investigator assigned as the lead investigator on the case is, uh, is their commander, Yagamuchi. And, and what's, what's interesting about the response I'm getting is I'm used to the fact that oftentimes, you, you know, there's that rivalry between law enforcement and private investigators, and oftentimes we get ignored. But in my experience, I know that from other cases, if I give a lead, at some point somebody says, hey, thank you, you know, we're looking at it, 
And if I don't get an initial response, I can re- uh, you know follow up and then get a response. But if I don't, I can go to the, the next guy in, in the chain of command and eventually somebody says, I'll get back to you. I've even uh, emailed the chief of police a couple times and don't get a response. So I, I get the sense that this is such a critical case to them that they're not communicating with anyone outside of law enforcement circles because once that happens, they lose control over that. So obviously anything they say to me, you know, can come back to bite them because they've been so widely criticized. So I don't fault them for for ignoring me. It's nice when they can at least acknowledge, thank you for the email. Because uh, many people out there, if they get ignored, they try to make a big stink about it. But I, I know, you know, my role in this as a private investigator, I'm not going to solve a crime. It's my job to get leads, provide them to law enforcement so they can solve the crime. Because ultimately, it's a prosecutorial function. It's a function of the state. I, I cannot prosecute a crime. We're looking at doing things independently of law enforcement, trying to steer them the right way. We heard recently in, the, in, a, in a news uh, piece last week that they're done with the DNA testing and the information has been received from the lab back to Boulder, and I guess we're waiting to see what happens next. Meanwhile, from our investigation, I have uh, reached out to certain members of the Cold Case Foundation, Dr. Ann Burgess and uh, Dr. Gary Bricado, who appeared as co-guests on the interview room with uh, Chris McDonough, and uh, it was a, an offer that they made that they would go through some of Gary's writings and uh, his audio recordings that Michael had uh, made of Gary during phone calls, and they're running transcripts of that stuff through AI, and it'll be interesting what their AI analysis is going to be about Gary. I would imagine. It's going to come back that he's a sadistic, you know, pedophilic monster, and it's like he's perfectly capable of committing such a crime, which doesn't take AI for me to figure that one out. Yeah. And at some point, some forensic psychologist or forensic psychiatrist has interviewed Gary Olivia. And there was actually a forensic psychiatrist who was consulting on this case did you hear about him, Jason? I think his no, name was. No, no, I haven't uh, heard about any psychologist that interviewed uh, Gary over the years. Well, I don't know if he interviewed Gary directly, but he was hired in this case to consult. His name was Stephen Pitt. He was a psychiatrist. And I would just, I Googled it to find out. Craig's shaking his head, but he was, he was murdered in the summer of 2018. He was gunned down by an unknown assailant so it kind of baffled me well it just makes me think of the risk of getting involved in some of these cases stephen pitt was involved in some high profile cases but uh, he was murdered and i he he was a consultant on this case i have an answer to that in terms of the motive behind this psychiatrist murder at least What's reported to the media is that there was a uh, an Arizona man that actually killed six experts who were involved in various divorce proceedings. So it, pretend, it sounds like perhaps he was uh, targeted because maybe he testified in favor of one side that uh, and the other side uh, wasn't uh, amenable to the to the testimony. And uh, this is why I don't generally get involved in uh, a, a child custody and or divorce cases uh, for that very reason because you do increase the chance that. Uh, you could be targeted. Wow. Out of all the dangerous cases we work with, and then you get gunned down in a family law case yeah, over right. divorce. I mean, wow. Okay. But did did he do, who did he interview? I mean, I, I wasn't aware of it either. Uh, did, or was he, how was he involved with uh, Gary Oliva? I, I don't know his, I don't know if he interviewed him directly, but he was involved in the John Bonet case. He was hired as an expert retained to consult with And I just always think of, you know, if we go back in time, you know, who, what forensic psychologists 
were involved or how did they consult? What was their role? Or did anyone do a risk assessment on Gary through the years? I mean, at some point, if you're in the criminal justice system, you've been evaluated by a psychologist. I'm just curious. Well, like he, I would, he would have want to, to read those reports. Yeah. Well, so if you know what what Jason was saying is that he he got paroled out of out of the system out of prison in Oregon, right? At, for after he served time for this sexual assault. You know that you know generally. Well, this is in California and in most states. Um, if someone's going to be paroled where they've been convicted of a you know serious offense like like rape or sexual assault, um, they generally have to go through a risk assessment, and that's what we do. That's what you know forensic psychologists do as well. And I've done several, or many of these, and we're we're, de we're determining what you know his level of risk to be released to the community. And generally, the, the parole uh, departments or you know agencies will require these to be um, done before someone is is released. And in states where there's SVP or sexually violent predator statutes, like California has, I don't know about Colorado. Um, oftentimes, they you know we end up civilly committing these folks because they are just too dangerous to release. So I don't know what they did in, in in Oregon with with Gary, but it sounds like he was he was paroled, which suggests that. And again, I don't know if they did an assessment of him or not, but I assume they've some at some point, like you said, Danny, he probably was assessed, and that would be interesting to look at to see what what's the level of risk with this guy and how did they assess him? Like what what assessment method did they use? Was it a formal assessment or was it one of these you know where you get you know you get a psychiatrist maybe that's not using um, some of the actuarial tools that we use to become more confident in our in our risk analysis. Well, and sometimes even when we do write a report, there's already a plea bargain that they've already made a deal for uh, felony probation. I just recently did one. It's already been determined. They already confessed or it's, it's a, made a, make a plea deal. And so the system, it doesn't hold them. There are loopholes. Yeah. People get, people wow. get released that shouldn't be released. That's for sure. And they're, they pose a danger to the community. Well, Jason, I am curious about a few other cases you've been working on. I know we talked about the O.J. Simpson murder trial and you have a whole, you've got, you could do a whole episode on that. We also have the murder of Tupac, which has come up and you've got the details on that. So I find that you have one of the most interesting positions. Uh, you get the scoop. You're in you get hired, you're retained in these investigative cases. And so I was recently, somebody reached out to me about a cold case and I can't talk about it right now, right? But now some of these cold cases are coming up. And one of the, one of the things that came up for me is that the law enforcement doesn't have the budget, right? They've drained their budget or they, they, they don't have the resources to allocate on that specific case. So sometimes citizens or nonprofits or people are funding it, which is in this one case I'm consulting on, that's what's happening. And so Jason, like I'm sure people would love to donate, right, to your cold coalition because I would, <laughs> I'm interested in solving these cases. And so do you have a way of getting your information out there for people that do have the funds that support what you do? And they see the value of it. But I know that so often you work for free. You do this all the time for people. And it's amazing what you do. But I, I think people fail to consider that this isn't a paid position. You do a lot of this work. Which we love you for. But I feel like I want people to financially support this, too, because it's our community. It's our safety. Right. Yeah. Uh, all that I do on these cases are pro bono, they're, you know, voluntary. If it's through the Cold Case Coalition, yeah, I'm not getting paid for it. In fact, uh, anything that I want to do, 99% of the time, it's out of my own pocket. Uh, just like uh, the John Bunny Ramsey case, I've paid uh, for the experts. I flew to Colorado. I've done this and that. What's uh, interesting on these cold cases my most expensive case out of pocket was the Rachel Runyon case, where one of the key pieces of the crime was that the abductor that ran with her 
threw her into a blue-colored Pinto wagon with wood grain panels. I purchased one from Pennsylvania and had it shipped here just for the case, just to be able to show a living example. Is this the car that you remember, you know, show, pointed out to a witness? Because seeing it in person is a lot better than a picture. And I couldn't even find one online, a picture of it. So I ended up buying one on a barn fine auction through eBay. And ultimately, you know, the cost for that case, for me, I'm already into it, $11,000. Okay, I saw you post that car <laughs> and I, I made fun of it. <laughs> and so I'm sorry. Are those the ones where the gas tank, uh, you know, can't be well? I, I, I was like, or, Jason has really well, terrible taste with well, this car. Te technically, technically, what you're pointing out to, Craig, is uh, the Pinto runabout okay. that yeah, the rim yeah, that had the you know that had the screw that if it was rear-ended yeah. would spark and ignite the car. Right. This is a Pinto Squire. Yeah, I ended up getting this particular one shipped to me, and our suspect that we later identified had friends that lived across the street that called the suspect's family, grandpa and grandma, and this particular individual uncle, that they would do sleep outs in the car. So when I brought the car forward and took pictures of the interior with the blue vinyl interior, which, you know, gosh, that's pretty posh. Anybody <laughs> with a pencil wagon like mine is going to be the envy of everybody, <laughs> especially in these classic... Uh, you know, classic car shows, but... Dude, driving a but, Pinto but, itself should be a crime. <laughs> yeah, I love that about you. You go the extra mile. You you, you brought the knife sheath with you on the show, and we did that. I like to waste uh, money. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, as we wrap it up, where can people find you? Uh, obviously, people want to hire you, but I do want... I feel like you should get paid for your work. You do a lot of wonderful work and we appreciate it and thank you so much for coming on the show tell people where they can find you or if they want to make a donation sure if they want to find me personally my my website is jensenprivateinvestigations.com if they want to look up the coalition or donate to their it's uh, coldcasecoalition.net uh, you know certainly uh, they can donate there or if they want to donate to the lab itself, it's Intermountain Forensics uh, is the website. And that is a 501c3, the lab itself. So any donations made there is a complete write-off for tax purposes. Well, I love that. Let me know if there's anything I can do to help support you getting these cases funded. And then, Craig, where, where can they find you if they want to hire you as an expert witness? Well, it depends on what state I'm in, I guess. But, like... Uh... I guess uh, you would just go to my website, right? That would probably be the best way to go. It's uh, Carson Psychological. Of course, spelling that becomes an issue for a lot of folks because they misspell the psychological part of it. But uh, anyway, that, uh, I, that, I learned that I probably should have uh, shortened that website address name. Maybe, maybe, maybe Carson Psych. Anyway, Carson Psychological is uh, my uh, website, my practice website. So yeah, where I do my expert work, just like you. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much uh, for coming on today. And I look forward to exploring more cases with you guys in the future. Thanks for listening. Killer Psychologist video episodes are now on YouTube and you can post your responses there. For episode details and merch, check out killerpsychologistpodcast.com. And for forensic services, you can book online at psychologydr.com. That's psychologydoctor.com.